we'll talk about Swarm. The representative suite for serverless applications targeted to benchmark commercial and other state-of-the-art clouds. So what runs in serverless clouds? From the historical perspective, the first segment of the cloud market that serverless targeted was um, the best offer and low cost, non-critical jobs where it is, uh, the, the price is more important than actual performance. Also, um, due to the scaling requirement, um, serverless jobs, as you recall, are stateless. So the first target applications um, were stateless jobs, stateless workflow that, for example, transformed inputs into outputs um, in throughout the application. Um, today, service application domains are growing and uh, they tend to include um, more classes of applications that were um, insufficiently fast uh, in service clouds before or prohibitively expensive. So today it is common to see dynamic and uh, dynamic workloads and workloads with uh, change in traffic over time. Serverless is a good fit for jobs that uh, level that can benefit from um, immense parallelism in a, in a concept uh, like renting a supercomputer for a couple of seconds or minutes. Um, with uh, performance of service applications becoming better and better every year, well, latency critical applications um, become one of the main classes uh, available um, in serverless clouds. And finally, data intensive applications become common as well um, because um, modern clouds uh, show significant progress in executing um, data centric, data intensive applications. So uh, keeping all this uh, different classes of service applications in mind, we put together a suit which would, and also a methodology to evaluate arbitrary clouds. So what, so what are the suits already available there and why they are poor fit for this new serverless clouds? Uh, out there. So there are uh, solutions from uh, the industry, like spec cloud benchmarks, um, and from the academia uh, called Cloud Suite. Um, the, the main benefits of these solutions is their robust methodology for performance analysis developed by academics and industry experts, but um, they are not representative of uh, serverless clouds because they run different applications. However, um, there have been initiatives of uh, putting together benchmarks for serverless systems research. Uh, for example, serverless bench, SAPS, FASDEM, PFAS, and so on. The problem with those applications is that they usually target a small, um, a small number of applications and they don't cover the whole spectrum of various cloud applications uh, that are executed in serverless. And there is no robust methodology for uh, evaluating performance of uh, clouds and comparing different clouds um, one with another. So the goals we set for the new, um, for our suite of serverless workloads uh, is to cover first is uh, to cover the entire spectrum of uh, different serverless uh, application characteristics. For example, um, the, the execution time of serverless jobs um, can be from super short millisecond jobs to uh, relatively long, like uh, jobs up to fifteen minutes. For example, um, there are also different classes of applications covering workloads from analytics to machine learning and um, web serving. Uh, there are also um, different communication patterns that appear in these applications. So we try to cover all of them, like from pipeline to scatter-gather broadcasts and so on. 
And there are different scenarios where people would like to benchmark uh, their systems and innovate. Um, so there could be uh, single host deployments and uh, also cluster deployments. Um, at the same time, it should be possible to run systems of an arbitrary scale and run an arbitrary mix of uh, synchronous and asynchronous applications. Okay, so let's talk about the benchmarking methodology um, with VHive and VSwarm. Um, so the goals of uh, this methodology is to enable versatile benchmarking with um, like benchmarking system of any size deployed on, a, on clusters of uh, um, any scale, uh, running any number of instances um, per function, and also different types of functions. For example, um, applications composed by nesting function calls um, or as a workflow or data flow um, with different asynchronous um, uh, characteristics. Um, the methodology itself is uh, rather simple. There is a number of uh, load and latency clients that inject uh, the same message, uh, hello message to all the functions and in a particular interarrival time and uh, um, according to the distributions uh, that are already supported or from a trace, which will be supported later. Um, and um, measure the these clients measure the response time uh, either directly for synchronous uh, functions that actually uh, send the response back or um, collect a synchronous event through a service called time series DB to capture um, the propagation time through a pipeline or uh, another type of asynchronous workflow. At the end, uh, the clients, uh, reconcile all the measurements uh, from both uh, the synchronous invocation side and the and the asynchronous invocation side. Okay, so the benchmarking suite includes the following. Um, first category of uh, functions are individual functions or uh, leaf functions um, that are independent from each other. Um, and it also includes complex applications, uh, which each of which consists of a collection of functions. Um, the benchmarks are integrated uh, with conventional cloud services. For example, they use uh, AWS storage, but they can also use different kinds of storage. And some of this support is uh, on the way already, like Elastic Cache. Uh, in it, in this um, the way benchmark suite is uh, done, it um, should work with any types of uh, uh, conventional services and any clouds um, by adding minimal uh, lines of code. Um, <clears throat> the benchmarks also support distributed tracing and microarchitecture analysis tools, uh, as well as uh, simulation images for. If you attend sessions in the afternoon, you'll see like how to work with any of these tools. We'll have uh, three different tutorials on all three, actually, um, like hands-on sessions. Um, and also what's important is that functions can run in VHive and AWS uh, uh, Cloud is in progress. So we'll see how to deploy one of these benchmarks in um, both clouds that I mentioned. And you can add more clouds uh, if you need as well. It is also possible to plug and play different components, like different types of uh, different services uh, from the cloud or even the load balancer. Talking of the individual functions, um, the goal of this uh, subset of functions was to uh, run, was to experiment with the serverless host load and evaluate the efficiency of uh, its software and hardware uh, stack. Uh, these functions are, are written in different languages. Some of them uh, do the same thing, uh, but have different implementations. 
this is uh, for the study of uh, efficiency of uh, the same logic executed in different functions in different runtimes. And uh, many of these functions were uh, taken from existing suites um, such as Death Star Bench. There are also micro benchmarks for synchronous and asynchronous function composition, um, which is essentially a producer consumer scenario which can be configured for different communication patterns, such as uh, scatter, gather, and so on. This also supports the asynchronous mode where a special driver function would execute producers and pass um, the produ produced data to consumers uh, asynchronously. There are also a number of um, complex serverless applications, um, video analytics and MapReduce and training of simple uh, machine learning models, as well as uh, workloads uh, written with GG compiler, which um, uh, Frankie is going to talk about. So let's start with the first one. It's called video analytics. It consists of three functions. Um, first one, in is um, invoked by the same by the client with a hello message like before. And then it injects the video fragment into the second function, which decodes frames and invokes um, object recognition on each of them. Um, the pattern is a pipeline, even though it's written in the nest in the synchronous way. Uh, and the parameter is allowed to change uh, the fan out uh, of uh, object recognition. The next function is MapReduce, which is a classic uh, analytics function. It has uh, two implementations, one in Golang. Um, it's a um, core framework uh, developed uh, by one of the engineers. So we just adopted it. Um, and also there is a, a Python implementation coming from AWS. Uh, it's uh, their reference architecture for MapReduce. The benchmarks, um, there could be many benchmarks. Um, the most uh, the easiest to use are word count in both cases, and also um, the Ampla big data bench aggregation query, um, the one node data set. Um, this is one of the um, academic uh, queries for. Uh, database uh, performance evaluation. So as in any MapReduce, the communication patterns are scattering together. There is um, a function for iterative hyperparameter tuning. Uh, there is an application uh, which consists of two functions, the driver and uh, the trainer function. With the trainer function um, um, being able to train different models, with different parameters. Um, particularly in each iter the training happens in iteration with the driver and worker trainers with subsets of data sets and uh, reducing the number of trainers and the number of models uh, that are produced as a result uh, in every iteration. In this case, uh, scatter get a pattern and uh, one can configure the number of uh, trained models. This function aims at uh, um, benchmarking uh, workloads that change their compute needs um, dynamically. Another function is uh, um, machine learning stacking and ensemble training. So in this case, uh, the outcome is a two layer ensemble model that is trained. Um, the driver uh, triggers a number of trainers, just like in the previous um, uh, workload, but it does it only once. And after that, uh, the driver invokes the reducer to collect the trained models um, and passes them to the meta trainer, which actually trains the two layer ensemble model um, as a result. Um, the fan out is configurable again. So now I would like to hand the mic to Frankie, uh, who is one of the um, authors of GG. So Frankie, please take over. Cool. Uh, 
Uh, give me permission to share my screen. Lee. There we go. Uh, just share your screen and uh, open your mic so we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, I think it's good now. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Cool, yeah, so thank you, Dimitri. Um, so I'm gonna give you a kind of brief overview about GG, which we kind of dubbed uh, platform allows you to go based from laptops to lenders. And just to give you a sense of why it's an interesting thing to be added to uh, vSwarm and to give you a sense of the kinds of applications that it brings along with it. So what is GG? GG is a framework and, and a toolkit that makes it practical to outsource everyday applications uh, using these thousands of parallel threads uh, that cloud functions provide today. So what are some examples of these everyday applications? Well, some of these could be uh, what we, what I list here. So there's, we, what we've done is we've ported several latency sensitive ones, such as software compilation, unit testing, video encoding, and object recognition to GG. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Really, GG allows you to um, port really any application that you would like to GG that can be expressed as a, as a DAG, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So just to give you a sense of why this is uh, kind of what the motivation behind GG is and then to understand why it's a good fit for, for vSwarm being able to study um, cloud functions in general, let's talk a, couple, a bit about the challenges that went into the design. So the first is soft, that software dependencies must be managed, which was, has been touched on in uh, some of the sessions earlier. So, when you think about the way that uh, data flow frameworks work like Spark or Hadoop and stuff like that, we don't really need to worry about uh, the software dependencies. And one of the reasons for that is because you basically boot up a, warm, a cluster, you keep it warm, it has everything that you need on it, and you kind of just keep that running uh, for as long as you need it. The catch here, which has been touched on, is that if you want to keep this running for a while, for example, let's take a 10,000 core cluster on uh, EC2, it's gonna cost you about $400 an hour. And that's not even considering, uh, like if you just wanna keep that running, um, you know, for a couple of hours or maybe overnight, it's gonna get very expensive. So this is not a good fit for one-off tasks. If I wanna run something like, for example, I want to run my compilation, uh, just on a one-off, uh, or if I have a single video that I want to be able to encode, this is not a good fit. So what we did with GG is that we did basically created a way to be able to con uh, containerize uh, an executable along with its arguments and environment and its input data. And what we call this is a GG thunk. And what these dunks are really the units of compute that are shipped off to these uh, cloud functions to be able to uh, compute the actual uh, compute in the actual function. These dunks are idempotent, the data is immutable. And as I'll show you in the next slide, it is named by the hash of its contents. So here's what gets shipped off to the serverless functions. Let's say I have a very simple program of wanting to do, you know, a GNU hello, hello world. And what you'll see is, uh, basically that each one of these square or each one of these boxes is a function that you would chip off. So for example, in the pre-process step, we describe the arguments that you would do, uh, for example, here, and as well as the object inputs and an output. And in order to be able to build this as a DAG, all of this is, the contents of it is hashable, which is then used for the next step, which in this case is a compilation. Now, this is very simple what I show you here, but it can actually be built up into much, much larger DAG. So here you see uh, uh, GNU hello, and you can already start to imagine that what this allows is for really large uh, DAGs and really large scale applications, the kinds of which were the serverless was not actually designed for, but that GG was one of the first to really show that it could be used kind of like a supercomputer. So another example that, that Dimitri was alluding to earlier 
is uh, dynamic dependency graphs such as Fibonacci, the, the Fibonacci sequence, which also can be um, run using GG. And what this basic, what I'm kind of showing you here is that, that the applications were, when they express their jobs, they're using a, what's called this GGIR, which is this stunk abstraction. And what's nice about GG is that the front end is what emits this GGIR and the back end is responsible for computing that. The two are separate from each other, which means that they can be developed separately and expanded separately. So as the applications evolve, it can be done separately from the computer and storage backends. And this is really what allows GG to plug into uh, platforms such as Beehive because its backends are so uh, extensible. So the second and last point that I'll touch on for uh, which hopefully will give you a little bit of a sense of the type of research that you can be that you can do in conjunction with Beehive uh, using GG and, and BSwarm as a whole is that these cloud functions are promising, but they're hard to use well. So ideally, we'd like to be able to rent a lot of these functions for a few seconds on AWS Lambda. And if we do it for a little bit of time, it'll actually be pretty have a pretty nice and reasonable class. However, uh, um, there's been some existing work on this. So this is not the first work that I actually proposed that. So there's been like, for example, X camera, Pyren, some stuff in uh, video analytics space, uh, as well as some people have actually tried to port Spark all the way to uh, Lambda. But there's been a couple of challenges to being able to realize this. So the first is start of time, and the other is interfunction communication, which you actually touched on in uh, the, the intro to uh, AWS Lambda tutorial. So one of the things that GG did is it basically was able to spawn up these functions very quickly and provided a very low overhead. So what you see here is compared to some of the existing systems, GG actually run, is pretty efficient in being able to spawn up a, a very simple function, Slick 2. But as you'll learn about later, one of the things that Beehive has enabled and is able to show is that if you can really get this, this time down and this cold, uh, this cold start time down, um, you will be able to uh, really expand the, the applications that you can run on it in a latency critical manner. The second thing is that with this, this pesky interfunction communication, there's been a lot of uh, ways that people have proposed to do this. So for example, X camera, which did uh, video encoding, basically had a turn server that you would, it would basically decide which functions to send requests to, some other frameworks have been proposed use storage uh, clusters. Uh, there's been some serverless caching work and there's even been proposals for direct communication. All of these are different things that um, GG has actually allowed us to uh, explore. And I encourage you to, if uh, while you're using BeastForm to also take some of these things to account and to be able to think about like how you could explore and really propose new ways for serverless to um, really expand in this direction. Because as Dimitri said, this is a really bright direction to be able to explore. And now just to get a, uh, a brief sense of really what GG was able to uh, enable. So on AWS Lambda, if you want to do compilation, for example, of like Chromium, if you were to do this with a uh, distributed compilation uh, framework such as ICC, you're looking at something like on the order of like 45 minutes for that compilation. Now you look at doing this on GG and you're doing this in under 20 minutes. So they're get, GG really is uh, able to push uh, this interactivity um, between two and five times faster than ICC. And really what it's, a, but really um, more importantly, GG is able to show that you can basically use serverless computing for something it wasn't originally designed for, which is these massive, uh, is basically a massive supercomputer. So my takeaway here is that GG uh, in the VStorm suite is a very unique workload. It was designed for applications to leverage thousands of parallel threads for short bursts, as I talked about before. So it's something that's unique and that, um, that I hope you'll take advantage of uh, not just with the application that we have here, but to be able to bring all the other ones uh, that you may come up with. And that the because the front end and back end can be evolved separately, 
Uh, this allows you to basically develop applications. So for example, want to focus on how do you design APIs? How do you design applications for serverless? That can be designed separately from somebody who wants to be able to explore the backends uh, such as Beehive um, with GG. So that's my, that's all I got for GG. Um, happy to, uh, if you have any questions or follow-ups with it, please do let me know. Uh, and I'll leave this last slide for you, Dimitri. Thank you. So what we did is we developed a unified benchmarking methodology and we put together a set of workloads for evaluating um, serverless clusters and uh, serverless hosts from different perspectives. Um, it allowed them to, to integrate different services, uh, both for uh, from the serverless perspective, but also from conventional clouds as well. 